Good morning, and thank you for joining us for a new episode in the museum's Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. During each episode, we examine the relevance of Holocaust history to our world today. This morning, we'll be looking at the human dimension of the Nazi war machine and the genocide committed in the chaos of its wake. The systematic murder of millions of innocent people, Jewish people, required tens of thousands of others to either look away, offer support to the killers, and for some to actively participate in mass murder. There were many who were true believers in Nazi ideology who enthusiastically embraced the violence. Others were attracted to a racist movement that offered camaraderie, that used alcohol to dull their inhibitions, or that even created a celebratory atmosphere through the strategic use of music. Please join me in welcoming today's guest, Dr. Edward Westerman, who is Regents Professor of History at Texas A&M University, San Antonio, and the author of books including Drunk on Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, Edna. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for waking up. I know it's extra early Texas time. So. During the course of the show, viewers, please post your comments or questions in the comments section, your questions for Ed in the comments section, and we'll get to as many of them live as we have time for. Now, Ed, let's start by thinking about the way that the Nazis reframed or even manipulated many aspects of German society to attract followers. In specific, how did they weaponize the concept of masculinity? Well, I think it's important to understand that this is a distorted form of masculinity that the Nazis promote. It involves a very strict idea of racial structure, of strict gender roles, and it in, embodies this idea of toughness or hardness. And so war and violence become key markers of masculine identity uh, in the Third Reich. And I think we have some propaganda posters that kind of get to that idea. So what we're looking at here is a poster that says, we workers have awakened. And for the viewers, you'll see in the foreground uh, this very so-called Aryan looking tall man, and he's in a very assertive and aggressive pose. And if you look closely, you'll see he has his fist clench in this case, and he's, he's opposed by these smaller, weaker individuals that represent communists, Jews, and socialists in German society. And then if we look even closer at that in the background, we had a swastika that was granite, uh, and it, it evokes this idea of strength. And this also carries forward into other images, for example, for the SS. And I believe we have an image of that as well. This is a recruiting poster for the Waffen SS or military arm of the SS. And looking at that poster, you see a square jawed, uh, very upright uh, uh, German uh, SS man with his weapon at the ready, which is really important. And if you look also at his tunic, at the uh, blouse that he's wearing, you see a red spot, uh, a red spot there, which would be the Iron Cross, which is again a uh, an award for bravery. So young men who would look at this picture would aspire to to be that individual because at that time. Uh, it's not sports heroes that young men try to emulate, but really military heroes that are kind of glorified within the Third Reich. And you've done extensive research on how the Nazis used and abused alcohol uh, to further their aims. Could you tell us a bit more about how that fit into the war and into this distorted or warped idea of manhood? Yeah, for some viewers may be aware that Hitler himself didn't drink. He doesn't smoke, for example. So what we have uh, is kind of a paradox here. Uh, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, the public health issue is to, uh, to attempt to keep smoking and to keep drinking limited for public health reasons. But on the flip side of that, we have the German cultural practice that involves extensive drinking, uh, beer drinking and others. And this leads to uh, the shared camaraderie that we see in scenes, in this case of a police battalion, that they're building camaraderie, they're affirming the acts that they're involved in. And those acts, in this case of this police unit that are celebrating at, Wood, at the Wood's ghetto in occupied Poland, is they've been involved in interdicting uh, Jews smuggling in and out of the uh, ghetto in Wood in 1940. So they're in fact celebrating uh, some of the acts that they've been involved with, which, which include uh, the murder of Jews. And uh, this idea of the incorporation of celebratory ritual uh, and drinking uh, 
uh, into some of these acts, I think gives us an insight uh, into this idea of masculinity that I talk about. And also the social dynamics at play, because these are groups of men, uh, very hierarchical, who are engaged in really brutal and terrible acts all day long, and then they blow off steam at night in drunken parties, right? That, that's, uh, that's, that's exactly it. And so what we have is alcohol is integrated uh, into uh, the acts that they perform, and it becomes part of a ritual, a celebratory ritual that's associated with that. Now, it's important also to say that there are individuals who uh, can only cross their uh, inhibition to murders, especially in the case of women and children, through the use of alcohol consumption. So we see alcohol as a way to dull somebody's senses in some cases, uh, but we also see alcohol being integrated as a facilitator uh, for a murder in the East as well, in these occupied territories under German control. And in some cases, we have, uh, we have survivors who talk about looking at the perpetrators as if they're involved in a wedding atmosphere is the uh, term uh, that the survivors or the witnesses use. And I think that's very important because it gives us an idea of what they're seeing as a celebratory, uh, the celebratory ritual. And this uh, also extends into the concentration camps uh, during the war. And I think we have an issue here. Uh, we have some uh, photos of Auschwitz uh, in this case. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm actually going to pause for a second if we can stop that. Sorry. It was uh, my fault. I asked you a question a little earlier because I got kind of excited about it, but I want to pause actually also and uh, welcome our viewers who are watching from all over the country. Um, good morning to those of you joining us from Orlando, Nashville, Goldsboro, North Carolina, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Carroll, Iowa. And we also extend a welcome to our international viewers who are watching from as far away as Australia, Montreal, Canada, uh, Colombia, Veracruz, Mexico, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. We're so glad that you're here. Um, and I wanna turn back, you mentioned uh, briefly about how this was used also as specifically a way to uh, facilitate or create a mood that was conducive to mass murder. And indeed, um, this campaign took a, a very brutal and violent turn after Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941. Uh, there were really two battles being fought. One was focused on military victory by the German armed forces, but the second was a front that followed behind uh, the advancing troops, one waged by Einsatzgruppen or mobile killing squads whose sole job was to murder civilians. And they showed up in their towns uh, would round up, gather, and then engage in all-day shooting massacres of innocent Jewish men, women, children, the elderly, into mass graves. People may be surprised to know, and we're looking at some images of people who were killed in this way, that almost one-third of the six million victims of the Holocaust died in these mass shootings. The photos we see here are of those killed in a massacre at a now infamous ravine called Babi Yar uh, in Ukraine on the outskirts of Kiev. Um, I'd like to turn in particular to these killing sites, these sites of atrocity, Ed, and talk about the way that alcohol helped to fuel these massacres where men were shooting all day long. Um, what was the function and uh, was it only in this way on the military front or as you just hinted also in camp settings? Yeah, we see the incorporation of alcohol in at both the killing sites and in the camp areas. And again, the function is to build camaraderie, to lower inhibition amongst the men. And also it's a reaffirmation of group togetherness. And so in this picture, we're looking at uh, SS doctors gathered uh, at Auschwitz and you see uh, almost for happy hour, if you will, uh, they're gathered here. And we have another image that, uh, that shows this close camaraderie again at Auschwitz. And when one thinks about what's happening in these sites of mass murder, uh, that this is the way, in fact, uh, that, the, uh, that the perpetrators are decompressing uh, as they're involved in, in this idea of murder. I think it really gives you a different perspective on the daily life of the perpetrators and how they're negotiating uh, their duties. And we have a, a photo that I think is also a very striking photo in this case of two SS men and they're on the Eastern Front. And this is uh, sometime around 1943 and they're chugging, uh, they're chugging alcohol. And what they're actually chugging is bottles of champagne, bottles of French champagne, as a matter of fact, 
which again re, re, uh, raises the issue of alcohol as a luxury good that's sent to the troops, the SS and the police in the East and incorporated uh, into their daily lives and their daily rituals. And I think also we see, um, and we've heard many, many stories, direct testimony of kind of drinking challenges that similar to things that many of us have witnessed today in our own lives, that the idea of how much alcohol you could withstand is somehow a measure of, of manliness. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And that kind of measuring one against another by how you can drink and still maintain your composure is very much a marker of masculinity in the period amongst these groups. Now, I want to make clear, and I know this is an important point of yours, that we're not excusing. It's not that alcohol was a necessary factor. Most, if not all, of these killers probably would have killed without it, but it made it a little easier. It was a, a social lubricant. It um, released some inhibitions as well, and so it's just one factor of many. Now, Ed, so far we've been talking really just about literal intoxication, but there was also a metaphorical intoxication among these men. Many of them were drunk off their own power. Um, and everyone who's had a drink, who's gotten drunk or tipsy knows it doesn't change your basic character. Um, so let's talk about one man in particular who not only abused alcohol, but was certainly um, drunk on his own uh, ability to hurt others, a man named Amon Gert. Who was he? Yeah, Amon Gut was an Austrian SS officer, and uh, some of the viewers may recognize him from Schindler's List. He was the commandant in charge of the Plaszow uh, camp in occupied Poland, uh, and uh, he was involved in a number of brutal actions, killing actions against uh, Jewish uh, inmates of that concentration camp. And there's one scene in the movie that some may remember where he's holding a rifle and shooting into the camp uh, from the balcony uh, of his porch. And again, this idea of, of, of having a rifle, of uh, being manly, that's tied to this, mascul this idea of masculinity. And in fact, uh, this is not a creation of fiction. Uh, there were, in fact, SS commandants. For example, uh, uh, Gustav Wilhaus, who was at the Janowska uh, camp, actually shoots from the balcony of his office uh, into the camp. Uh, and kills inmates that way. So one of the things that we uh, we, we also see is that uh, survivors remember uh, this brutality and the way in which these individuals sought uh, to intimidate them. And there's a one story with respect to Goethe that I think is very revealing. He liked to have these drunken parties. He had Jewish prisoners form his music form a musical group, and they would play jazz, for example, at his parties. And at one party, there's a German administrator who's attending and good turns to him and says, you don't have the guts to kill a Jew. And uh, this German administrator actually had known a group, uh, a family of Jews, a, a husband and a wife who had two children who were actually in that camp. And to prove his manhood, that German administrator then goes out uh, during this drinking party and shoots those four individuals as a manifestation that he could be as tough as the SS. So again, here we are seeing that distorted masculinity uh, in operation. It's a really um, disturbing and obviously cruel criminal form of, of one-upmanship. Uh, we have a comment from a viewer named Shannon who writes, masculinity in and of itself is not bad, but when people accept, accept stereotypical forms of it, particularly when combined with intoxicants, whether alcohol, power or a society rabid for what they view as redemption, it can be dangerous. And that is exactly the dynamic. Yeah. And I, and I think that we can, we can add on to that when masculinity uh, is, uh, is elevated as something superior to femininity, for example, when, when what's supposedly womanly is considered to be less the less powerful, less good than what's considered to be masculine. That's when we start to see that distorted uh, concept of masculinity. So I think that's an excellent point. Now, Ed, Gert was infamous for his cruelty. Was he held accountable for his crimes after the war? Yes, he was, uh, he was a quite notorious perpetrator. I think we have a mugshot uh, that shows him uh, at his trial. He's actually going to be tried 
uh, in Poland uh, after the war for his uh, and his actions in occupied Poland, uh, and he will be executed for his actions. However, the other side of that story is that the great majority of perpetrators, uh, tens of thousands of those who were involved in mass murder, never faced courtroom proceedings and never faced punishment for their actions uh, in these in, in these occupied territories. Now, you had mentioned that uh, Gert was forcing some prisoners at Plashov to play musical instruments, and he was not alone in this. Other camp officials would also uh, force prisoners who happened to be musicians to play, uh, to offer a literal soundtrack, sometimes even to horrific scenes of violence. Describe for us a little how music function in these settings, please. Yeah, what we would normally not consider as part of music uh, is that it would be incorporated into acts of uh, humiliation or acts of torture uh, against prisoners. And in fact, uh, the SS uses music uh, in, a very, uh, in a very refined way to integrate into some of these actions of killing uh, and torture. And I believe we have an, uh, an image here. Uh, this is at the Janowska uh, concentration camp. And the prisoner orchestra is formed not only to entertain the SS uh, and the German camp staff, uh, but also to play during shootings and uh, beatings and floggings. So we see the integration, the staging of the use of music uh, as part of these rituals of abuse uh, against, uh, against prisoners. And I think that that's really a, one of those kind of horrific, if you will, uh, issues that we face in looking at how music can be abused. And the Nazis did this in a very premeditated manner. And, I, and again, I think we have another photo where we see the very same, uh, the, this very same issue in the Mauthausen camp. So this crosses over uh, from, different, uh, from different camps in which, uh, in which we see how music uh, is integrated into the process of murder and humiliation of, these, uh, of the prisoners themselves. So it has a sort of dual function. It uh, degrades the prisoners who are being forced to, to play their music in this entirely unintentional setting, uh, but it also reinforces the feeling of buddies that we had described earlier, singing after a long day of killing um, with drinks or around a campfire. That's exactly correct. Um, I'd like to pause for a moment also to welcome a viewer, uh, Al Munzer, who is a dear friend and a survivor who volunteers at our museum who's watching. Welcome, Al. We're glad to have you here. Um, Ed, I'd like to take some of what we've been talking about in very general terms and, and make it personal. Uh, we have an interview from a woman, a survivor, who describes how music was used as a terrifying signal to she and her fellow female prisoners in her prisoner block at Auschwitz. Tell us a bit about Ruth Elias before we hear from her in her own words. Yeah, so Ruth Elias uh, was uh, about 20 years old when she's deported from the camp ghetto at Theresienstadt uh, to Auschwitz. She was married at the time. She'd gotten married at Theresienstadt. Uh, and now she's sent to Auschwitz uh, to a barrack that also ha houses the Mel Camp Orchestra. In that barrack at the time, one of the things that she doesn't know is that she was actually pregnant at the time. And uh, her testimony relates to what she experienced when groups of drunken SS men entered her barrack at night. Let's hear from Ruth directly. And it very often happened that the drunk SS in the evenings came into block number six. First of all, they, they woke up the music orchestra. The music had to play. In came the SS with, the, with their bicycles. And then they started to climb up and to look for women, for nice women, and to take them out. And when we saw the SS coming, so we just went to the wall because we didn't want them to see us. We were all afraid of it. That was, the girls were screaming and that was terrible. That was terrible. It's a, a very deliberate form of cruel theatricality to use music to exploit it in this way as a cue for, for gang rapes um, and also forcing the male prisoners to witness these crimes. Viewers, if you would like to learn more about Ruth's absolutely incredible story of survival, you can listen to her full interview. Uh, 
We will be sharing the link in our comment section at the end of the program. Uh, now, Ruth's testimony helped shed light on sexual assault during the Holocaust. It was a widespread crime, a widespread trauma, but it wasn't publicly discussed for some time after the war or was rarely discussed. Ed, can you help us understand just how common sexual violence was uh, during the war and some of the factors that drove it? Yeah, this will probably be one of the things that uh, surprises many viewers because there's a prohibition. Uh, there's a, a uh, on so-called uh, racial uh, defilement, which means that Germans, Aryans, so-called Aryans, are not uh, supposed to uh, to engage in sexual relations with so-called inferior women. And in fact, what we see uh, is even though this is a crime in the Third Reich, this metaphorical intoxication uh, of the perpetrators over the land and bodies of others leads to widespread uh, acts of sexual violence against women uh, in these occupied areas. In fact, one estimate is that over 50% of SS and policemen stationed in these areas engage in sexual violence. And a generation uh, of female scholars really have been responsible for directing our attention to this issue and bringing it, uh, bringing it to light, especially in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And it makes sense to a certain degree that this is a subject that is a very difficult subject and was a very difficult subject uh, uh, for survivors to speak about because there is, as today, a certain stigma often attached uh, to sexual assault and sexual violence. But here again, what we're seeing is in some cases the integration of alcohol into these acts. And in contemporary society, I think uh, we're attuned to this idea uh, of alcohol and sexual violence and masculinity when we look at things like contemporary stories about fraternities or sports teams. So this, this sheds light on an issue that is also broader in some cases beyond the Holocaust. So you're painting a picture for us of a chaotic, a chaotic environment that really unleashes some of the worst impulses and makes um, men feel free to, to act on them. Uh, and that's constant threat of sexual violence made women vulnerable in ways that fewer men experience, although of course men can also be sexually assaulted. I'm struck, it reminds me of some uh, very disturbing news reports that I and I'm sure many of us watching uh, have heard today, particularly about um, systematic and widespread uh, sexual violence against women in a conflict in Ethiopia happening now. Um, Ed, we have a viewer question. Um, a man named David from Chicago is asking, can you speak to the issue of how we talk to young people and teach them about history so they don't end up admiring or aspiring to be like Nazis because of their power? And he writes, I think I read that young people, especially adolescent boys, are at risk of admiring the power asserted by evildoers if they are not presented in a way that they really comprehend the horror. Can you comment? Yeah, David, I think that's a great question because as a young man, I myself read a lot of history and some of that history that came out in these paperbacks, these, uh, these cheap uh, uh, books that one could buy at the time, uh, were kind of a glorification of military and the military might of, uh, of Germany in this case. And so what one doesn't get uh, when one reads those uh, uh, many of those histories is what was involved with that military expansion, what was involved with the control over those areas. So what I think is really important is that when we look at historical processes and we think about uh, our history, that we look at both sides of what that history pertains. So what did it mean not to be a victorious soldier, but what did it mean for the people who were subjugated and what things were done to them and what they experienced? So I think that that's, that's a key part of teaching history is to look at these, uh, this, uh, this, these perspectives of the others as well. If I may also add to all of the absolutely correct things that Ed just said, there's also the ability, and we have documented cases, where you can show uh, soldiers or members even of these shooting squads who took another path, who said, I will not do that. I will not commit that crime. And in fact, uh, suffered little to no consequences for stepping out or stepping away. So I think showing alternate models of what happens when someone follows their conscience uh, also can help to complicate a young teenage boy's view. Yeah, and Ed, I'm so glad you mentioned that point because for some of the viewers, there's a myth that continues to circulate that if the killers didn't participate, they themselves would be killed. And in fact, that is a complete myth. There's not one, uh, one example of that uh, that can be shown that somebody who said, I can't do this, 
was themselves then executed for not participating. They might have gotten uh, bad work details. They might have been called a number of names, but it never it never happened that they were at risk of their own life. So I think that's that's a very important point to make. Uh, Ed, so far, we've only been talking about women in sort of passive ways as targets of violence. But in fact, many women were also part um, either in kind of innocuous ways or um, not particularly direct ways or more directly in Nazi campaigns of brutality. Like men, they were also recruited and galvanized via propaganda. What kinds of messages were targeted at women and girls? Yeah, so I think we uh, we have another propaganda poster here. This is the joy of motherhood. And uh, looking at this poster, one sees clearly that this is the idea of uh, glorifying uh, motherhood. The, a woman's role is to have children, to have healthy children, uh, is the idea behind Nazi propaganda directed at women specifically. Uh, and that includes also things like good girls don't smoke or drink. Uh, we also see that it's the promotion of having many children to kind of man, if you will, uh, the thousand year Reich. And here we have a photo uh, that is of a ceremony. This is a ceremony that I you know, when I talk to my students, I call this the birthing Olympics because this woman is receiving what's known as a mother's cross. And for four healthy children, uh, she would get a bronze. For six healthy children, she would get a silver. And for eight healthy children, uh, she would get the gold. So very much the regime is uh, is promoting uh, women to have uh, to have children, and that becomes central to their role uh, under this idea of uh, what a woman is supposed to do. We're getting a number of viewer comments uh, where people are expressing how the increasingly polarized climate here in the United States uh, is pressing them to understand in a way they hadn't previously how ordinary people might be drawn to conspiracy theories or to extremism. Uh, one viewer in particular, Pete, writes that until now I would not have believed that propaganda would be that powerful. Uh, any thoughts on that, Ed? Well, I think that propaganda is essential. It's one of the three pillars of the Third Reich. So terror, terror and intimidation uh, and legislation are the other two. But propaganda is a key way that we form our ideas about the world. And it comes from many, many sources. And I think it's important for us to think about the sources that we take our information from and be critical in the way that we look at the information we receive. And also not to overstate the role of propaganda. It helps to um, kind of make people numb to certain acts or to make them feel enthusiastic about it. But often the motivators are uh, much more mon mundane and relatable. And I think we can see that in this next series of images that we'll be looking at. Uh, the museum has in its collection several photo albums created by Johann Niemann. And we're seeing a photograph of those here. Um, from the He was the deputy commandant of the Sobibor Killing Center. And one of the most striking things about Niemann's personal photos is that, th that they show killing center personnel at play with women among them. Ed, what are we looking at here, please? Yeah, I would describe this as happy hour at Sobibor. And what we're seeing is uh, SS guards, those who are involved in mass murder, uh, sitting, uh, drinking, often music is involved. This is the SS canteen, which is a pub restaurant site uh, for these men to decompress in. On the table, what we also saw were the fine, uh, fine uh, crystal ware, uh, and those are accoutrements. Those are things uh, that were stolen or plundered uh, from Jews that made it to the camp and who were subsequently killed. We also see gender relations here, the uh, easy familiarity of these SS men with these Polish and Ukrainian uh, women who are a part of the cooking staff. Uh, uh, that served these men on a daily basis. And to think that this uh, SS pub is essentially within walking distance of the gas chambers, I think, again, puts a, uh, puts a, a, a new light on thinking about how these men are normalizing the process of mass murder and how they are, in fact, in some cases, celebrating uh, and decompressing from their own, uh, their, their own acts of atrocity is really a striking uh, a really striking image and a striking source to think about. As we can see from the body language in these photos, these are affectionate, um, intimate kind of relationships. Uh, viewers may be surprised to see ordinary civilian women pictured in this setting, but the camp needed people to do these men's laundry and cooking. And I think we can also 
uh, infer without knowing about these specific women, but knowing about similar relationships, all of the kind of heroism and glorification of athleticism, of being in this impressive uniform, um, women might fall in love, they might admire, uh, they certainly would admire someone who was powerful, who could give them better food, who could protect them from violence. And this is all happening, as you said, within walking distance of gas chambers where 167,000 human beings were uh, being gassed to death with poison. Uh, women, though, were not only behind the scenes at killing centers, as we saw in that last series. Let's talk in particular about a female staff, um, camp staff member named Irma Gresa. She was the antithesis of kind of idealized femininity or soft power. What do we know about Irma Gresa? Yeah, Irma Grace, and I believe we have a, a, a picture of her. Uh, she entered the uh, female SS. She became an uh, SS camp guard, an auxiliary guard. And uh, she serves at Bergen-Belsen. She serves in Auschwitz. And survivor accounts, the female uh, survivors who remember her, uh, remember her beauty. In fact, she's, uh, she was uh, described as this beautiful blonde woman and becomes uh, this beast uh, of Belsen is her nickname because uh, in addition to her tailored uniforms that she wears, she has a whip that she tucks into her boot and she carries a revolver around and she uses both of those to beat uh, to beat prisoners on a regular basis. At, Aus at Auschwitz, she's involved in the selection uh, of women to go to the gas chamber. And so here we see a case where uh, in this area uh, of the concentration camp where traditional gender roles uh, for women in this type of role, where they can be expanded uh, to include things that we normally would not associate uh, with, uh, with women. And that's the abuse and the beating and the mass murder involvement in mass murder of others. But I think it's an important reminder uh, that when we think about genocide in general, it's a societal endeavor and it crosses over genders and both genders are involved in this case. And Grace also was unusual like Amangut in that she was actually held accountable in a court of law. Uh, we're seeing here some footage from her at the time of her trial and her defense attorney tried to cast doubt on the credibility of survivors who were testifying. He claimed she was just a uh, a kind of a, you know, duped. She was a poorly educated young woman, powerless to withstand the so-called Nazi propaganda machine. Um, I want to be clear, though, that although the two perpetrators we've been talking about today were both sentenced to death after the war, they are very, very unusual. And the vast majority of perpetrators never saw the inside of the courtroom, nor faced any punishment. Most of them simply melted back into society and lived normal lives. Um, Ed, we have received several questions about the use of drugs, of um, you know hallucinogenics or things that would make you high. Can you speak to that briefly, please? Yeah, there. Uh, some of the viewers may be familiar with Norman Oler's book Blitzed, which talks about pervitin, uh, which is a methamphetamine, and it was used to keep soldiers awake on the Eastern Front and during the uh, Nazi campaigns, the German campaigns uh, into Europe, into France, for example, as well. However, I think it's really important uh, for us to understand that uh, the use of these types of inebriants, uh, alcohol or drugs, is not, uh, it doesn't allow for something to happen. It's, it's integrated into the process of murder, but it doesn't excuse the actions of the murderers in that case. And we have another question and comment from a viewer named Jim. He wants to know, even considering distorted masculinity, alcohol, and peer pressure, I just can't get my head around how so many could commit so much violence. Didn't these acts conflict with some moral standard that they would have learned in childhood? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and what I think it's hard for us to understand is that some of these young men were socialized for periods of a decade or more under national socialism. And so the standards that we talk about uh, that uh, we would consider to be a uh, standard moral compass that most people have, that becomes distorted under the Third Reich. Uh, for example, groups who are not so-called Aryans are excluded from your universe, uh, in that case, of moral care. Uh, and we see that uh, what socialization can do uh, and how it can transform people's values and beliefs. And we see that in contemporary periods as well, 
uh, in, in for, for example, if we think about cult environments, a very similar process takes place. There's also the dynamic at play that the Nazis promoted that uh, Jews of all ages, even little infants, uh, would have been considered a threat to so-called Aryan society. And so there's this um, twisted psychology that somehow it's self-defense to engage in crimes like these, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are no innocents, according uh, to the Nazis. And in fact, Himmler makes that point uh, to his SS police and policemen when he says that those young boys and girls will go grow up to be uh, the avengers of their parents. And that's part of the reason why uh, he talks about it so necessary for his SS and policemen to be tough and hard in their duties uh, and to execute everyone. So it's actually sort of a hijacking of the kinds of ethics or morality they might have learned as young people, but um, harnessing to a very um, racist and hateful goal. Absolutely. Ed, I want to close with this. We have a question from a viewer named Myrna. She wants to know, why is it important for new generations to know about this? And I will add, this is very difficult material. It's hard to spend so much time scrutinizing perpetrators. Why, why do you do this work? Well, when I talk about the Holocaust, one of the things I think is important for us to all understand is it's not just about something that happened uh, uh, in World War II some of the very same actions and some of the very same processes uh, that involve uh, the actions of drinking, that involve the actions of racial hatred or ethnic hatred, uh, we see the dynamics continue to take place in our current world. And uh, many of the viewers will be familiar with what happened in the Balkans in the 1990s or Rwanda during the genocide in 1994. So some of the dynamics that I've talked about today are very much part of that dynamic. And also for me, uh, I've had several friends who are Holocaust survivors, and you mentioned that Al was watching today. But one of the things that as a historian, they've often said is that we as historians can't really understand the Holocaust. And they're absolutely correct uh, because I wasn't there. But what I think is really important to understand is as I've talked about these really horrendous aspects of human behavior, it will be beyond the belief of many of the people who watch today, but it was the lived experience of those survivors in many cases. And I think that that's something important to talk about as well. Well, thank you, Ed, so much for teaching us today, but also for confronting us with uncomfortable truths. Um, I know we all learned a great deal. Well, thank you for having me and thank you to the audience for all the great questions. I know that it can be much more comfortable or uh, easy to sit with to imagine that the Nazis and their collaborators were somehow monsters or brainwashed, but Ed, you've described for us a culture that enticed both men and women to either tolerate violence or to directly de commit it themselves uh, because of very relatable factors or motivations, that feeling of being with your friends, the feeling of getting drunk and losing some inhibitions, uh, appetites for lust or power, things that are all too human and to which anyone could be susceptible. And it's a deeply, deeply troubling reminder, but also a caution to us that all societies are vulnerable to such forces, especially in times of turmoil or chaos or lawlessness. So thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our viewers for tuning in today, and we hope that you will join us for our next program, which will take place on our regular day of the week, Wednesday, December 8th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time here in the United States. As we described a little bit in today's show, under Nazi ideology, Jewish children were considered no less dangerous and were targeted no less brutally than adults. And in a time when so much of the world abandoned them, some people still chose to stand up and protect vulnerable Jewish children. Join us to learn the story of how this seemingly ordinary Christmas portrait, in fact, was part of the rescue that saved the lives of the Jewish boy and girl brother and sister posing by the tree. So we hope to see you on Wednesday, December 8th. Until then, wherever you are, be safe, be healthy, and well. Bye-bye.